Have you ever been someplace and wondered if you belonged? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you walk in, and everyone else seems to know exactly uh, what's going on and how things work, and you just try to pretend you know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I've had this experience. I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to bash anything. This is, you know, not in my notes, you know, but... Uh, it's kind of a customer service thing for me. Like sometimes you'll walk somewhere and like you'll, you, or you'll sign your kid up for some sort of a thing, you know, like some sort of a sporting thing or whatever. And you know, you, they signed up, you, they know, you know, they they know you're going to be there, but you show up and you just kind of like, everybody just seems to be going wherever they're going to go. And nobody greets you. Nobody like says, Hey, is this your first time? How can I help you? This is how this thing works. And you just kind of like, have to like figure it out and it just feels really awkward you know you're like okay what do i do here you know um you pretend what's going on <clears throat> you know let's just let's just say you are in a position where uh you need to get into shape okay <laughs> okay i know i know i'm sorry <laughs> i'm really really pushing things here you know maybe you need to build some muscle lose a few pounds um so you decide to go to the gym right you walk in and everyone seems to be so serious about what they're doing. They are making beelines from machine to machine. They know exactly what they're doing. You see these rows of machines, and you have no idea what they all do. Um, do I put my arm on this pad, or do I put my head on this pad? Or how, does, how does this work? Uh, maybe this is just me, but that was my experience going to the gym. You know, it's like, do I push or do I pull? They have pictures on them, and they show like what muscle you're supposed to be working out, and you're like, I didn't even know there was a muscle there. You know, you're, how, how, how does this machine help me work out, you know, this muscle, you know? And, and it's just confusing. Everyone around you looks like they should be on the cover of Bodybuilders magazine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, and you start to wonder, am I in the right place? <laughs> like, is this really a place for me? Um, is the gym a place for people that are uh, out, of play, out of shape and they need some help? Or is it a place for strong people to show off how strong they are, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, because I don't think I fit in. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to a, a gym like that or had that experience. Or maybe you felt that way at church. Uh, it could feel like everybody else, they know what's going on, and they're kind of here, and they're like, they just, they're all serious about Jesus and church stuff, and you're, you really don't have a clue. Everyone else is sure, or they seem sure, but you have doubts. Everyone else has it together, but you're falling apart. You know you need God, but you wonder, am I really gonna, do I really fit in at church? Is that really for me? You know, we're in a series called Who Needs Church? And last week we talked about the importance of the gathered local church, okay? The church being together in the life of a believer. You know, we talked about how we never get too mature for church, uh, we never learn so much that we just don't need it anymore. The church is not obsolete. It's essential, right? So the local church is the way God has chosen to physically demonstrate his work in the world today. It, it's, it's a visual representation of God's work in the world. And so if we're a believer and we're a part of that work, we should be a committed, integral part of the local church. For our own benefit, yes, okay? but also to minister to others around us. It all goes together. But too often, the church can start to feel like the bodybuilder gym, <laughs> you know, where it's kind of everybody's just kind of showing off their, uh, their spiritual muscles. It's a place where the people who have it all together, they just are putting the finishing touches on their spiritual physique, you know, <laughs> just getting just a little bit better, a little bit more spiritual. But it doesn't feel like, there's a place for the person who has no idea what's going on. But how many of you know, a lot of people have the sense, and, and you may have the sense, you know, if I don't get into shape spiritually, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I have, I have spiritual needs. I, I'm not where I need to be. You know, the church should be a lot more like physical therapy than the bodybuilder's gym. <laughs> you know, I mean, think about it. It's not a place to show off how spiritually strong you are, but it's a place for those who have been wounded, those who are experiencing pain, to regain their strength and receive help. That's what church is. You know, last week we talked about how the church is the body of Christ, okay? 
And Jesus is our example in everything. And if we want to see how the church should be, we should look at how Jesus lived. Okay? We, what Jesus did, we should do. And so this morning, we're going to look at an interaction that Jesus had that's going to show us what kind of church we need to be and exactly who the church is for. And this interaction is found in Luke uh, chapter 5, 27 through 32. And it tells us about the calling of one of Jesus' disciples. <clears throat> so in Luke chapter 7, or no, chapter 5, verse 27, it says this, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, also called Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." You see, Jesus calls people from every background and social status. In the time of Jesus, the nation of Israel was being occupied by Rome, okay? It was a Roman empire. And the people of Israel, as you can imagine, didn't like it. And so one of the least favorite things that the subjects of an empire do is pay taxes to the empire. <laughs> it's probably one of your least favorite things too. I don't know. But uh, this tax collection was usually done by a Jewish person because they knew the people in their community and they essentially would be able to gather the most taxes for Rome. They would be most effective in their job of collecting taxes. And these tax collectors, they were given the power of the Roman army. They would be accompanied by Roman soldiers and if you didn't pay your taxes, the Roman army was after you. And so these tax collectors would often actually extort even more money than Rome was requiring, and they, would, and they would pad their own pockets, and Rome didn't care, and it was just worked out for everybody. They got their money, and people got taken advantage of. You know, these uh, tax collectors, they were viewed not only as dishonest and greedy, <laughs> they were viewed as traitors to their people. Um, but Jesus didn't seem to care about Levi's profession. He didn't seem to care about uh, the life that he was living and the baggage that came with it. He called him to be one of his disciples, and Levi left everything to follow Jesus, okay? So the first thing Levi does after he leaves everything and follows Jesus is he invites all his friends to hear from Jesus. And guess what kind of friends tax collectors have? Other tax collectors, you know? <laughs> Guess what, you know, they fought, have people that are in similar situations. And so he has a banquet dedicated to Jesus so everyone can meet Jesus. What you might say is he invited all his friends to church. And so a whole bunch of people that were not the typical uh, uh, religious type people were all of a sudden hanging out around Jesus. And the Jewish religious leaders, they start complaining about these kinds of people. And Jesus' reply to them gives us our mandate as the church. This is what Jesus said. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this is the NIV. The New Living Translation explains it like this. They explain that last phrase and says, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. And so... I think that explains well who Jesus is calling to follow him. We know that in order to follow Jesus, you must admit, you know, it, it, we say it every time we say a sinner's prayer. We say, I admit I'm a sinner. I need Jesus, okay? So that's a, a foundation of faith in Christ is admitting that we actually need Jesus and, the, and that we don't think that we're righteous on our own. But the, the New Living Translation is actually explaining something that uses fewer words in the original language. The, the NIV is a lot closer to the original language, okay? It leads us to a literal translation, and it gives us an additional insight. So if we assume that the only way that we're righteous is through Jesus, let's make that assumption because it's true, okay? That the only way that we're righteous is through Jesus. When Jesus says, uh, now listen, I haven't come for the righteous, I've come for the sinner. 
My mission is not for the righteous, but for the sinner. What he's saying is, is listen, if you've already put your faith in Jesus, the mission has moved beyond you. <laughs> I haven't, it's not about gathering together all of the people who believe in Jesus, who've put their faith in Jesus. It's about calling sinners who are far from me to turn and believe in me. And I, I shared this quote a couple months ago, but it summarizes what Jesus is saying here. William Temple, he was a leader in the Church of England from 1921 to 1944. He said this, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. And so it is not an institution that exists so that we can gather together and feel good about ourselves. It's not the bodybuilder gym, okay? It, it's the, it's the, the uh, physical therapy gym. Jesus came for those who were on the outside, those who were left out and who were not included, who everyone else judged, but he loved. And Jesus' mission is our mission. You know, towards the beginning of his ministry, Jesus, he went into the synagogue, which is Jewish church, and he read from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah prophesied about a coming Messiah who was going to save and deliver the people of Israel. And after he read this scripture, he said, this is about me. He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled. And so when he reads this, he is making a declaration about himself and his own mission. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Jesus came to the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. And we're his body. So his mission is our mission. And when we ask the question, who needs church? I, I knew what God laid on my heart for this week, but I, I, wasn't sure how to, I wasn't sure how to put it. I wasn't sure what words to use. And so this is, I feel like these are imperfect words. But what I came up with was who needs church is the down and out. The down and the out. <laughs> you know, when Jesus called the tax collector Levi and, and he hung out with his friends, we see that Jesus is for those that were out. The, the tax collectors were cast out of socially acceptable circles. And they were even outside of the kingdom of God. They were living unrighteous lives, most of them, and were not seeking to be good Jews or to follow God. Jesus tells us that he's sent to the poor, the captives, and the blind, and the oppressed. Those people are down. They're down on their luck. They've got problems. These are the most underprivileged groups of people imaginable in the time that Jesus is talking about. And we're going to take a look at how God has called us and anointed us to reach the down and the out. Those who are struggling and those who are outside. But first, I want to take some time to pray, all right? Is that okay? We pray in church? All right, praise God. <laughs> God, we just ask that you would show us your word this morning. God, we pray that you would take uh, your word in Scripture, and God, that you would reveal to us what you have for each one of us, God. You can take uh, your written word and you can make it alive to each one of us in a way that is unique to each one of us. God, your Holy Spirit can speak to us. God, you can move on our hearts. And God, I just ask that you would do that this morning. God, I pray that you would help us to know what the right thing to do is and God, that you would uh, give us the power to do it. Help us to, help us to reset wrong patterns of thinking, and God, help us to accept your kingdom way, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, okay? Now, throughout the Old and New Testament, concern for the poor is a constant message, all right? When we hear poor, I mean, if I'm honest, I, sometimes I wonder, what exactly does that mean? Okay, what does it mean when we say the poor? Is it someone who makes below a certain dollar amount? Okay, they, you know, they're below the poverty line. Is it someone in another country who's starving from a famine? Uh, in the Old Testament, there were several conditions that were associated with poverty, uh, which they really had to do with being in a vulnerable position. 
due to not only financial situations, but social and relational situations, okay? In Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, this is what the prophet Zechariah said. Then this message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. And do not scheme against each other. You look at this list of people that uh, the prophet talks about, and this is repeated multiple times, kind of all through scripture. We see this, these uh, people together, widows, orphans, foreigners, the poor. Um, you know, widows are, are, are people that are alone. They're alone. They're often older, but not always. You know, we look at orphans, children, that, that they don't have intact families. They're at risk. They're at risk. They're easy to oppress. They're vulnerable. We look at those who are foreigners, those who are immigrants or refugees who are away from their home country, and they don't have anyone that's on their side where they are. We look at people that are poor for any of those reasons or other reasons. And God specifically mentions them over and over and over again in Scripture. And he says, listen, you need to be kind. You need to have mercy towards these people. And you need to never take advantage of them and defend them against those who might do so. You know, when a country experiences a uh, war or unsafe conditions, uh, people, they try to save their lives by leaving their homes to go somewhere that's safer. And they become foreigners. We call them refugees, Right. When Russia invaded Ukraine this year, it set off a huge refugee crisis with over 10 million people becoming refugees. 10 million people leaving their homes and saying, this place is too dangerous, I'm going to try to find somewhere that's safer. And so the Assemblies of God has an organization called Convoy of Hope that does incredible work um, and provides food and supplies uh, for people in in all sorts of different bad situations. Um, but Convoy of Hope has served meals to 2.1 million of those refugees, those Ukrainian refugees in several different countries where they are. And this church, Crosswinds Fernley, has given $1,624 to those efforts. $1,624 has come from this church to help people that are in that situation. So you guys have been a part of helping the poor all the way around the world. And, and I would love for our church to support Convoy of Hope on a monthly basis, okay? Because there are always, there's always things going on. You know, oftentimes what happens is, is like you have like a lot of news and it becomes a great opportunity to, to raise funds while people are thinking about it. But then guess what? The news moves on. And you know who's still a refugee? Those people. It's not safe. War's not over. But sometimes we stop thinking about it and we just move on. And there's people that are in difficult situations. And so, um, you know, I, in addition to special offerings, I think it's, I think it's incredible to, to every single month support these organizations. You know, not only around the world do we help the poor, but um, every month our church gives $100 to a local food bank to help those who are having trouble um, affording groceries, uh, we provide supplies for those who are experiencing unplanned pregnancies and they don't have the support that they need. And so these are all different categories of people that find themselves in need. They find themselves to be poor. And Jesus announces good news to those who are disadvantaged in their everyday survival. That's what poor means. People who are disadvantaged in their everyday survival. You know what good news is to people who are hungry? Uh, any guesses? Food. It's good news to people that are hungry. What's good news to an orphan? Being, being placed in a family, being home. What, what's good news to an immigrant? Being welcomed into a community. You know, this kind of kindness and care for the poor is a defining characteristic of the church. The church helps the poor. In the, in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul, he was missionary to the Gentiles, and so he was planting these Gentile churches, and the Jews were like, they, he, he went to the Jews, and he met with the leaders that were existing there, and uh, they were like, you know, okay, it's okay that you're planting these churches, and you know what? 
It's okay that they're not circumcised. It's okay that they don't follow the Jewish dietary laws. We're gonna, it's gonna kind of crazy to us. We don't understand it, but we're gonna, we believe God's doing something over here. But then the apostles said this, and it's found in Galatians chapter two. They said, they said, listen, the one thing that they wanted us to do was to make sure that we would remember the poor, which was the very thing I was eager to do. They said, listen, a defining characteristic, whether you're a Jewish church or a Gentile church, is that we remember the poor. That's a main deal. Our church, as God leads and allows, will be part of bringing good news to the poor. That's important, amen? And so, release for the captives. That's another thing that Jesus' mission is, and so should ours. So captives are those who have been captured and are owned by an enemy. In ancient times, countries would go to war and when they conquered an enemy, they would take all of the people and they would make them their slaves. They would become captives owned by someone else. Listen to what John chapter 8, verse 34 says. I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Each one of us is spiritually a slave to sin before we find freedom in Christ. We don't own ourselves. We've given up our ownership and we are a slave to sin. And to the extent that we continue to sin, we continue to be captive. But Jesus declares he's come to release captives. We don't have to be slaves to sin, right? Amen? And, and our, our message to the world is a message of release from captivity, okay? There's not only a spiritual element to, the, to this, there's a physical reality as well. There are still slaves in the world today. Human trafficking is, continues to be a major problem in the world, a major problem, even in the U.S., and the church has a role to play in bringing freedom to captives. There's a, an organization called Project Rescue, which does incredible work um, doing, uh, helping people that are caught in exploitation, okay, find physical, emotional, economical, and spiritual freedom. It's, it's an Assemblies of God missions project, and they're in multiple countries all around the world, and they do work helping people to find freedom. So it's, it's spiritual, and it's physical, and it's real. Sight for the blind is a part of the kingdom of God. It's a part of the message that Jesus brings. You know, so much of what keeps people in captivity is what they can't see. Have you ever been trying to, to convince someone to change their life, and, and they just can't see it? They just can't see it. You know, there's a spiritual blindness and the answer to spiritual blindness is divine revelation. We need the Holy Spirit to open up people's eyes. And so when, they, oh, when their eyes open up, they suddenly realize, oh, wow, God loves me. And that, that means I don't, I don't live my life the way that I've been living it. This happens in partnership with preaching the gospel. And the gospel is the declaration of the good news, right, that Jesus has come to set captives free, he's come to, set, to help blind people see, he, he's come to give freedom to the oppressed. You know, sight to the blind, it's easy to think about, you know, I've come to bring sight to the blind and just think about it in a spiritual context, but the reality is, is that this was a fulfillment of prophecy about Jesus because Jesus didn't just bring people spiritual relief to their spiritual blindness. He actually brought physical healing to people's bodies. <laughs> he actually physically opened up blind eyes. You know, it was a practical demonstration of the love and care that he had for people. Jesus healed them then, and he can do so today. You know, this is what Jesus said, or, or what James said. Uh, he said, if there's anyone sick among you, have the elders of the church anoint them with oil and pray, and the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. There's two people that, that I've anointed just today and anointed with oil and prayed for. We have prayer at nine o'clock in the morning on, on Sunday mornings, and uh, we have uh, opportunity after that. There's some time, and if you, if you ever want to be anointed with oil and prayed for, we'll do it during services sometimes, okay? We're going we're gonna to do that, um, but uh, come early. I mean, next week, or stay after service, and I'll pray with you, and uh, we'll, we'll believe that God will bring healing to your body. You know, we know this. We know that not everyone who prays for healing gets healed here on earth. I'm sure all of us have prayed for someone to get healed who wound up dying. 
That's a reality. That's a reality of the world that we live in because the kingdom of God is not yet fully revealed, right? In other words, heaven has not yet come to earth, okay? Um, we still deal with sickness and death, right? We, we see it every day, but we know we have eternal life in Jesus, and even if we die, we still get healed, right? We still get healed. And so in my own family, we've, we've had healings and in ways that the doctors did not expect and testimonies of God's healing power. We can experience healing on earth now. Jesus can do the impossible both in the spiritual realm and in the physical. He can make blind eyes see. And that's the message that we declare as a church. So the last thing is freedom for the oppressed. I don't want to scare you guys, okay? Is anybody going to get scared? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Did you know that demons are real? <laughs> Did you know that demons are real, but that our God is stronger? Okay. You know, Jesus came to bring freedom to the oppressed. And we have the same mission, okay? What's the difference between liberty for the captive and freedom for the oppressed? Okay, they're, they're similar. You look at the, there's, they're both in here, okay? Um, you know, captivity is a matter of ownership. Captivity is a matter of ownership. Someone or something has taken you over and owns you. Sin does this, and before you trust in Christ, you're held captive by the enemy. But once you put your faith in Christ, you are no longer held captive by the enemy. The enemy does not own you, and he never will. He doesn't own you. You belong to God. You've given your life to him, and now he holds your life. Now he holds the, the title deed to your heart. However, there's this thing called oppression. Jesus can own the title deed to your heart, but the enemy can oppress you. It's a continual distressing negative influence. <laughs> And uh, if the enemy is oppressing you, they don't own you. They're just beating you up, <laughs> you know? I mean, think about it. You know, I believe there are many things that are oppressing people that are spiritual in nature. They have a spiritual nature. Addiction is an oppression. Anxiety and depression are oppression. Suicidal thoughts are oppression. Habitual sin in the life of a believer can be due to to demonic oppression. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Amen? Amen? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so listen, this is not a spooky thing, okay? We live in a spiritual world and we see the effects of things that are spiritual all the time, okay? I mean, we know this. It, it's not something that like there's the spiritual over here and it's all spooky and weird and then there's the normal stuff over here and it's just normal. Like, they, they're not separated. They work together, okay? And so we're not denying the physical when we talk about the supernatural. We know the physical is real, but we know that the supernatural has an effect on the physical, okay? So I'm not spooky. I'm not sensational. You will ask my wife. I'm the least sensational person you'll ever meet, okay? <laughs> I just believe that Jesus can set people free from things that are oppressing them, okay? I'm not going to get weird about it. I just believe Jesus sets people free. Listen, you don't have to stay addicted, right? Right? You don't have to stay anxious or depressed. You don't have to be tormented by suicidal thoughts or kept in the sway of habitual sin. Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen, Jesus wants you to be free from oppression. And the road to freedom looks different for every person in every situation. God uses all sorts of things, okay? Okay? But no matter what the issue someone is facing, whether it's mental health, addiction, or any other kind of oppression, the church carries the mission of Jesus. We want to see people healthy, whole, and free. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So, you know, we carry, the last thing that Jesus said is he said, he said, I came to declare that the year of the favor of the Lord, okay? I came to declare the favor of the Lord on people. And so we carry the favor of the Lord and we declare with Jesus, this is the time. This is the time of God's favor. You know, you may have heard today is the day of salvation. 
You know, we have the opportunity to be good news for the poor. We can declare release for captives, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. But in order for us to do all of those things, we have to deal with that Pharisee inside of us that doesn't think that that sort of thing belongs in church. Okay? We, we have to, because, you know, there are probably people here, and, and I've been there, you know, there's probably people here that are like, you know, yeah, if I was dealing with that, I certainly wouldn't say anything about it in church. I mean, you know, I mean, nobody wants to hear about all that, you know. Um, and, and we have this tendency to, to try to impress others with our spiritual, uh, our spiritual acumen, or we just try to kind of stay separated from people. But we have to deal with that, and we have to say, listen, Jesus invited and attracted negative attention to himself. Jesus was scandalous in the people that he accepted and invited. Jesus drew to himself sex workers, prostitutes. He drew to himself violent freedom fighters, people that were the most radical far-right people you could imagine. <laughs> he, he drew to himself tax collectors who worked for the occupation. They were, they were cronies, okay, of the government, the exact opposite, and he drew them together. He drew people that were sick and deformed, people that were formerly demon-possessed, and everybody thought they were crazy, and all the people that the rest of society didn't want. Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick. It's not a rally for righteous people, but it's a place to bring together sinners who need a change of heart and mind. That's repentance, a change of heart and mind. So who needs church? The down and out. <laughs> and guess who that is? It's all of us. <laughs> if we're honest, we all have need. We all have been oppressed. We've all been held captive. Our church should be good news for the poor, freedom for captives, sight to the blind, deliverance to the oppressed, and a declaration of God's favor to the world. And so, you know, we do our best to share in practical ways with those who are down. We share God's love, and we invite those who are outside of the family into the family of God. But we never forget that without Jesus, we're all down and out. We're all outside of, <laughs> we're all outside of the favor of God. We're all oppressed and held captive by one thing or another. We're all in need of the gospel. You know, one week I might need God to heal my body. The next week I might need him to set me free from some oppression that I've been feeling from the enemy. You might be here, you might need freedom from an addiction that nobody even knows about. You may be held captive to sin and selfishness and you need Jesus to set you free by redeeming your soul. And you're in the right place. You're in the right place. This is the mission of the church because it's Jesus' mission and we are his body. And so the question I have for you is, how is God calling us as a church and calling you to be good news for the homeless, the drug addicted, the isolated and lonely, the poor, the oppressed, the depressed, the anxious, the angry, the disillusioned? All these things, these negative things, how is God calling us to be good news? You know, I want to challenge you. When you meet someone who is on the outside of society or they believe that they're, uh, they're too bad for church or they're bound by addictions or they're oppressed by a situation that they find themselves in, your first thought should be, Jesus came to bring good news to this person. And I'm Jesus' hands and feet and mouth. And so it's my job to bring good news to this person. And I'm a part of his body. So not only am I going to be a part of his body and do what I can on my own, but I will do what I can to bring them into community with the rest of his body, the church. When the down and out encounter Jesus, they are lifted up and welcomed in. They're lifted up out of oppression and they're welcomed in to the family of God, and we represent Jesus. You know, I just want to take a minute. We're, we're going to take a minute and pray, all right? So I uh, just want you to just bow your heads and, and just prepare your hearts. 
you know, maybe you're here this morning and you feel like everything is at its worst and you've totally screwed up your life. And you just don't know if it could even get any worse. Jesus says, I came for you. The down and out, the sinner, the lost. Maybe you feel like life has just dealt you a rough hand. Jesus says, listen, you're perfect for my kingdom. I've come to change things in your life and I've called you to be a part of that change for others. And so all that we need to do to see Jesus transform our life, it, it all starts by putting our faith in him as our savior. Savior means he's the one who sets us free. He's the one that heals us. He's the one that provides for us. That's savior. And we put our faith in him as our Lord. That means we follow him and he takes care of us. We're on the Jesus train and he's going to take care of us. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't done that, I want to encourage you, start this journey with Jesus. Start this journey with Jesus. If you're here and you have not put your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I just want you to raise your hand and I want to pray with you this morning. I'm not going to call you forward. Everybody's I, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, but I want to be able to pray with you this morning. So if you're here, you haven't done that and you'd like to do that, go ahead and raise your hand so I can see it. It doesn't look like anybody is here that hasn't done that, that wants to do that. So, you know, this message is really a challenge to all of us because I know in my own life it is easy to get comfortable with people that are already in. <laughs> It's easy to get comfortable with people that they already believe like I do and they've, you know, they've quote unquote got their lives together. But God's calling us to be radical in our approach to people who are down and out because that's really all of us. So I just want to, I just want to take a moment and, and I just want us to pray this prayer. I want us to say, I, I want us to pray in our own hearts and say, God, how do you want me to treat the people in my life? How do you want me to treat the people that I encounter? Is there someone that is in my life, maybe I'm thinking of them now, that maybe I, I've said, well, they're too far outside. They're, they're too far down. I don't really know if we, I can do anything with them. Or, or, you know, I don't think they would fit in at church. I don't think they would fit in in my life. God, what do you, how are you calling us to treat people? God, I pray that you would show us the way to be your hands and feet. God, that you would show us the way to truly be good news for the poor. God, to bring, bring freedom to those that are captive. God, to bring sight to the blind, spiritual sight and physical sight. God, to bring liberty to those that are oppressed. God, we ask that we would be a place where people would find your freedom and would truly encounter your kingdom. God, for those that are here this morning, that they feel like they are down and out. God, they, they sense the oppression of the enemy on their life. God, they, they sense a need. God, they need a touch from you. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on this place, God, and that you would meet our needs. God, that you would show us God, the way forward in your kingdom. God, you would help us to meet the needs that each other of us has. God, we pray that we would truly represent a kingdom mindset. God, your kingdom, it's not like the kingdoms of this world, but God, it's a kingdom of freedom. It's a kingdom of liberation. And God, we pray that we would experience it and that we would share it with others. And God, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, if you're here this morning and uh, you want extra prayer, you want prayer for something, you, you, want, you want to believe that God's going to set you free from something, I'm here. I'll be up here a little after service. If you want to get together sometime that's not right here, I'm willing to do that. Uh, you know, God can change your life, okay? Don't live life the way God didn't intend for you to live life. Amen? Amen? Find the freedom that God has for you. I'm going to pray for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen.